Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. This week, we're looking at one of my favorite uh, chapters of the Bible, and that's Revelation 14. So let's just jump right in. Our memory verse today is Revelation 14, 14, and 15. And I'm going to read that, and as soon as I read this, Lisa, would you lead us in then yeah. in prayer? Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Okay, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us again to another glorious Sabbath day. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we study your word and we listen for your, your voice and, and know what you have, the message you have for us. Please um, inspire us in, to listen and inspire our hearts to be open to receive your message and um, bless each one that is here present and, and listening online today, Lord, that they may be richly blessed through this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So the book of Revelation is an interesting book. It's full of contrasts, and each of these contrasts calls us to make eternal choices. We'll worship either the dragon or the lamb. We'll receive either the markest of the beast or the seal of God. Either will be far for the cunning deceptions of the woman in scarlet, Satan's counterfeit woman moment, or we will walk with the woman in white, which is God's true church. Either we will accept the deceiving teachings of the spirit of Babylon, or we'll rejoice in truth that flows from the new Jerusalem. So these are pretty stark contrasts. And as we make these as we make choices, these contrasts become more and more apparent. God is never caught by surprise. In these last days of human history, he has sent a special message designed to meet the need of the hour. Revelation pictures this message as being carried by three angels in the midst of heaven, flying with their urgent end-time message to the ends of the earth. Revelation's message invites all humans to make their eternal choice. This is a moment of destiny or a moment of decision. Our world is at a crossroads, and I'm sure many of you can see that today if you turn on the news. This is a moment of destiny. Each one of us is making crucial decisions each day. Character is not formed in an instant. And that's really important because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to wait see how things go, and then I'm going to get ready. And that's not quite how it works. Character doesn't form overnight. It's a result of a lifetime of decisions. As the Holy Spirit impresses our minds, as we yield daily to his impressions and allow our characters to be molded by the grace of Christ, we become more like Jesus day by day. Revelation's message of Jesus' final mes mer message of mercy to lead us from trusting in our own goodness and righteousness to living by faith and trusting in his grace. There will come a day when every human being on the planet Earth will have made their final irrevocable decisions. And once it's irrevocable, it's not changeable. Revelation's message of Christ's righteousness, which delivers us from bondage and guilt of sin in our lives, will echo and re-echo throughout the Earth. The day will finally come when the words of Christ will be fulfilled. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. And that's Matthew 14, 14. So let's talk of just a quick minute about has the gospel gone to the, the whole world? And for the most part, it has. There's only a few countries that struggle. But just about every country has internet. Just about every country has, has radio and television. 
And in places we know, like some of the, the more difficult uh, 1040 window countries, we see that God is coming to people in visions and dreams. And so the word, if, whether we get the word done or not, Christ will. And so we see that this time is fast approaching. God doesn't do anything without letting us know. And we see that in the warning of the flood. In Genesis 6, 6, and 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made him. So when Christ was getting ready with the destruction of the earth, with the flood, he warned man. He let, him know, they, he let them know what was coming. And then we see in Jesus' first coming that God warned the world actually quite a while before his coming. We see um, Daniel gives us some very firm time frames. And if you want, I think I have a, a, a slide that you can put up while I'm reading. So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision uh, and prophecy, and to anoint the Most High. Now therefore, and understand, know therefore, and understand that from the fo going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. And we can see these time frames being laid out here in this graph that is on the screen. So we see that in the middle of the week, we see the cross where Christ was uh, cut off. The end of it shall be a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then we shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end of sacrifice. We see that at the cross. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consumption which is determined is poured out unto the desolate. So we see that, that at, his, at, at Christ, when Christ would come, when he would die, and when the time period for the Jews at the end of the, at 34 AD was when the time for the Jewish nation was up. So God told us about that, but he didn't stop there. He takes us all the way down to close to the end of time, and we see that with the pre-Adventist judgment. It says, I watched until the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. His hair of his head was like wool. His throne was a flame of fire, its wheels burning. Fiery stream issued forth, issued and came forth from before him. Thousands ministered unto him. Thousands times ten thousands understood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we see that, <clears throat> that that is what happened. Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place and the judgment began. Um, for the, uh, for the dead. So then for Christ's final return, Revelation 12 through to chapters 12 through 14, God has spoken us to us. In these last days of human history, he has spent, sent a special message to the world and to his people designed to meet the need of the hour. He pictures this message as being carried by three angels flying in the midst of heaven with an urgent end time message. So we have to remember that these three messages are for our time. And we'll be getting more into that this, during the, these lessons. But these three angels' messages, the final message of mercy, a call to lead us from trusting in our own righteousness to trusting in the righteousness of Jesus, to justify us, to sanctify us at the end of of tie to glorify us as always though we must choose christ to surrender him to obey him and choices 
we make now will indeed impact the choices that lay ahead in the final crisis. So the more, ch the more choices we make for God, the easier it is to continue to make choices for God. When we don't make choices for God, it becomes more difficult as time goes on to make choices for God. So now is the time to prepare. So Scott, you're going to talk to us a little bit about which one? Eternal, Eternal choices. choices. Yep, a little right. more on that. Thank you. So um, my uh, Sunday's lesson talks about Revelation 14 being Jesus' final warning to our world, which is fallen and rebellious. And this is our last message of warning when every human being is going to have to make a decision which will be final and irrevocable, either for or against Jesus. Um, Revelation's message of Christ's righteousness delivering us from condemnation of sin as well as the grip of sin in our lives will echo and re-echo throughout the earth. And, and we see this being fulfilled in that even the, the last few countries that se where it seemed like it was more difficult for the gospel to penetrate, such as in Muslim countries now I think are being um, evangelized and Soviet Union fell some years ago. Um, and so those countries made it easier to evangelize. So I think now one of the things that we may or may not be aware of is that seemingly small decisions that we make on a daily basis have lifelong or even eternal consequences. Daniel may not have realized all that was implied in uh, him not eating the foods dedicated to idols at the table of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Thus, when we do some seemingly small things such as feeding the homeless or teaching Sabbath school or coming to Sabbath school or just smiling and saying hello to someone at church or somewhere else, we may be planting a good seed. On the other hand, when we tell a little lie or neglect to do something good, those small deeds will also bring a harvest. Um, so now the lesson's asking us to compare Revelation 24, 14 and 14, 6. So I'll read those. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. Uh, and then in Revelation 14, it says, 14, 6, actually I'll read 6 to 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Um, and so the comparison to, of these verses is basically that um, both Matthew and Revelation are talking about the gospel being preached universally um, and Revelation goes further and puts an angel to it. So an angel is, is sent proclaiming. And I think that is both probably literal and symbolic. So there literally are angels helping the message of God to go out. But it's also signifying the strength and the importance of this message. Um, and then it talks about Revelation 22, 7 12 and 20, when he says, Behold, I come quickly. And so I've often wondered why Jesus used the word quickly um, for a period that spanned already nearly 2,000 years. Is this because to God 1,000 years is as a day? Or could it be that he wants us to be prepared as if his coming were imminent? Um, I tend to think the latter because I think that we humans have a tendency to interpret the future in terms of the past. Thus, past experience would say that even though there have been wars, rumors of wars, famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes, he hasn't yet returned. So our conclusion might be that his coming might yet be delayed for decades or centuries when in fact it is imminent. People were not prepared for Jesus' first advent, even though it had been specifically predicted uh, at least 500 years before during the time of Daniel, uh, the 490 years that were cut off out of the 2300 days. 
Um, so the other reason Jesus might have said that he was coming quickly is that uh, while most of us wouldn't count the 2,000 years as quickly, maybe that his actual coming does not occur. Um, it appears quickly to us if we pass away. So someone who dies will experience Christ coming the next moment. So in that case, he needed to have been prepared uh, all the time. Um, let's see. So um, I think the word quickly, in, in my opinion, seems to mean that you need to make, it, make a decision today, today while there's time. So the same, I think, went for the people during the time of Noah, that they had 120 years to prepare for that flood, yet none except Noah and his three sons and their wives um, went into the ark because even though they were given a fair warning of 120 years, they didn't heed the warning and they kept delaying it, some of them, until it was too late. Um, and then there will come a time when, um, let's see, Revelation 22, 11 says, He who is unjust, uh, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Him who is holy, let him be holy still. For this, uh, and then First John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Um, so, I think in, in short, um, the eternal choices that we're making um, are sometimes in appearance to be small, but yet have important lifelong consequences. So it says, um, Jesus does not cha change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. And we'll stop with that. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Alyssa, you're going to talk us, to us about the Son of Man returning. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very interesting topic on, on that. Jesus has many titles that we can read about in the Bible, um, but he really puts an emphasis on his title around the Son of Man, and that's who is coming back to take us home. So we, you know, it's really worth a study to understand exactly what um, is, is, is being meant by that title. So <clears throat> central to our study this week is the second coming of Jesus, which is a fulfillment of his promise that he will return to gather his faithful to live with him for eternity, and also that he will execute his righteous judgment for all of humanity, as well as Satan and his demonic angels. In Revelation 14:14, 14, 14, we are given a detailed picture of Christ's second coming. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. We see here a picture of Jesus as the Son of Man. So what characteristics of Jesus does this title, Son of Man, refer to, and why is that important for us to understand? Jesus clearly wanted us to understand and connect this vision of him coming again as the Son of Man. The lesson points out that he often referred to himself as the Son of Man. And in fact, there are 82 references of Jesus being the Son of Man in the Gospels. Let's read together one example from when Christ stood before the high priest during his trial leading up to his crucifixion. We can find this in Mark 14 verses 61 and 62, and it reads, But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Interestingly, we learn here that the high priest asked Jesus if he was the Christ, the promised Messiah and Son of God. Jesus responded in the affirmative, stating that he is the I am, that he is God and the promised Messiah. But he also refers to himself as the Son of Man and promises that he would come back again as the Son of Man, sitting at the right hand of power, which is God the Father, and with the clouds of heaven, 
which are the heavenly host of angels. And he also makes the point that the second coming would be visible, not just to those who are saved, but also to those who are unsaved. To understand this title of Son of Man and why it's important, we should consider what Jesus did for us on earth during his ministry and what he continues to do for us in heaven. First of all, he came as a human to live among us and to show us the love of the Father. He identified with us even though he is God. Secondly, he came as a human to live the perfect life that Adam did not do. He was tempted in all points that we are and overcame. Thirdly, he gave his life for our redemption because we are not able to do that. And fourth, through his death and resurrection, he conquered sin and the penalty of death that we may be reinstated as sons and daughters of God and live with him for eternity. Jesus is qualified to redeem us because he became one of us, and as one of us, he overcame and was victorious. In Hebrews 4, 15, and 16, we read, and this is speaking of Christ's continual work, his continual work for us in heaven, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Let's look at a few more texts about Jesus being the Son of Man. In Matthew 16, 27, it says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And in Matthew 24, 27, and 30, we read, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then finally in Matthew 25, 31 and 32, we read, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. We learn from these texts that when Jesus comes back, it will be a spectacular event that all will see. Jesus is coming back with the great glory and power of the Father and with the angels, and at that time he will execute judgment according to our own works, both for the saved and for the unsaved. The destiny of the nations and all humanity will be decided for eternity. What comfort and hope does that give you knowing that we have a Savior that loves us so much that he walked the same walk we have on this earth, yet never sinned? We have a Savior that understands our struggles, our needs, and our pain, and he can give us victory over all these things. In Hebrews 2.14, we read, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So it is this Son of Man who returns in clouds of glory to take us home. And, and before I close uh, this, this lesson for, for Monday, I want to read from you a quote from Ellen White, and it says, Leaving the royal courts of heaven, Christ came to our world to represent the character of his Father and thus help humanity to return to their loyalty. The image of Satan was upon man, and Christ came that he might bring to them moral power and efficacy. He came as a helpless babe, bearing the humanity we bear. He could not come in the form of an angel, for unless he met man as man and testified by his connection with God, that divine power was not given to him in a different way to what it will be given to us, he could not have been the perfect example for us. He came in humility in order that the humblest being upon the face of the earth could have no excuse because of his poverty, 
or ignorance and say, because of these things, I cannot obey the law of Jehovah. <clears throat> Christ clothed his divinity with humanity, that humanity <clears throat> might touch humanity, that he might live with humanity and bear all the trials and afflictions of men. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. In his humanity, he understood all the temptations that will come to man. Can you tell us about the heavenly, heavenly judgment? judgment. Yes. yes. So we're going to talk a little bit more about um, how Christ uses the term son of man about himself. But we want to look and, and compare a couple of scriptures first. One is Revelation 14:14. 14, 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So in this scripture, looking at the Son of Man, we see the golden crown, which talks about his, his deity, and the sharp sickle, which shows the, the reaping of uh, the, the end times when we're taken to heaven. But the second scripture that's similar, only different, is Acts 1, 9 through 11. And after he had said these things, he lifted up. He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So what we see is Jesus, when he left, he ascended into the clouds, and when he returns, he ascended into the clouds. But what are these clouds? These clouds, according to Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as Sinai, as in Sinai in the holy place. So Christ went to heaven with a cloud of angels, and he will return in a cloud of angels. Now this concept of Christ on, going up in the clouds and the one sitting on the Son of Clouds was like to the Son of Man. As Alyssa said, um, it was 82 times in the New Testament. The, it is primary title Jesus uses as a reference to himself. So he sees it, we see that he uses this title about himself more frequently than, any other, than, than um, the other titles that he uses for, himself, for, for Christ. It, it refers to his humanity because he came to, to die on this earth for us which makes him partly human. His humanity, his humility, because he was willing to leave heaven and die for us, as a deity, in Matthew 26, 64, Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And it's also used as a fulfillment of prophecy. So when Jesus ascended to heaven, Luke records in Acts 1-9 that the disciples stood gazing into heaven. While they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Then as he comes and he's ascending, he will also return with these angels. There is a divine truth embedded in this passage that may not be apparent, but it's this same Jesus, the Son of Man, the one who walked the dusty streets of Nazareth, ministered in the crowds in the streets of Jerusalem, healed the sick in the villages of Israel, preached on the grassy hillsides of Galilee, and is coming again. The Son of Man, man is also mentioned, uh, as we talked about, in light of the judgment. We see this in Daniel 7, 9, and 10. I kept looking until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vestiture was white as snow, and his hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were of burning fire. A river of fire flowing through it came out from before him. 
Thousands attended him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court was set, and the books are, were open. So we see the same, the same description of God in Revelation 1, and we also see the courtroom setting set up in Revelation as well. Daniel 7, 13 uh, and 14 says, And I kept looking in night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man coming. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given glory, dominion, and a kingdom, that all these peoples, nations, and every language might serve him. His dominion, an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So why did Jesus, why did Daniel call Jesus son of man in something as serious as the judgment? What given what he, we have already looked at should be comforting in knowing that the son of man is central to the judgment as well. And Daniel 7, 9, and 10, Daniel views the seating of the heavenly court with 10,000 times 10,000 angelic heavenly beings gathered around the throne. The judgment is set, and the books, the celestial records of our lives, are opened before the universe. In Daniel 7, 13, and 14, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, the Father, and receives his eternal kingdom. The judgment reveals before the entire universe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have done everything possible to save humanity. So this judgment vindicates not only the saints, but also God's character against the false charges of Satan in the next three sets of scripture. What's really interesting to me and, and what I've learned in studying Daniel and Revelation is oftentimes we look at the judgment as about being us, about us. Are we good enough? And it's really not are we good enough? Is God good enough? And so this vindicates his character as uh, this judgment takes place. So we see in Job, we're going to look at a couple of two passages in Job that are, that are kind of interesting because uh, we'll look at Job 1, 6, and 12, 1, 6 through 12, because we see, and I'm, I'm probably not going to read all of this, but portions of this because I'm running out of time. But we see that there was a time when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan was among them. And they literally, God and Satan, contend over Job. God says, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? And Satan returns and says to God, does Job fear God for nothing? Because you've put a hedge around him, Lord and his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he is, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out of the presence of the Lord. So God and Satan fight over Job, and God says, okay, go ahead and test Job. God, Job is my servant. Then we see when we jump to Job 2 that they come together again. And God actually asks Satan, where are you from? And he says, I'm, I'm walking up and down on the earth, which tells us that Satan believes that he has a whole lot of authority on this earth. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him? And he still, um, he, and he's blameless and upright before God. Still, he holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy without cause. So as they, they continue to discuss this, God tells Satan and God go back and forth, and Satan says, well, you haven't, you haven't touched his skin. You haven't, you haven't um, put his life in danger. And so God finally says to him, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So we see that that similar action really does take place in just about all of our lives. 
And sometimes, some points in life, it's more difficult than others. So Psalms 50, 51, 1 through 4 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned. I have even evil in thy sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And Romans 8.11 says, There is therefore none, no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but those who walk according to the flesh and not after the Spirit. And in closing, I want to read to you from Ellen White. Christ's mission was not for judgment, but for salvation. God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. And before the Sanhedrin, Jesus declared, He that heareth my word and believeth me that sent me hath eternal life and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death into life. So we're going to talk a bit now, Scott, about the, heaven, the victor's crown. Victor's crown. So... The victor's crown, this is the reward that Jesus got and also that Jesus will be um, imparting to all of us who hopefully will be there in the, uh, in the new kingdom. So John describes Jesus as the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. So the word for crown is Stephanos, which is a victor's crown. Uh, it was also worn by an athlete or uh, one who won an important contest, the crown of glory, of honor. Uh, and then while Jesus was on earth, he, he wore this crown of shame, the crown of thorns, and he was reviled, ridiculed, and spat upon and whipped. But now he wears a crown of glory and comes as king of kings and lords of lords. Um, so that also reminded me of the... Um, seven churches it seems like to that they have a, a crown for each of the ones that overcometh and so for example for the ephesians he said to him that overcometh i will give to eat of the tree of life uh, which is in the midst of the paradise of god to smyrna he said they will not be hurt by the second death and to pergamos he said i will give to eat of hidden manna and will give him a white stone and uh the stone, and then the stone, a new name. And then I heard something interesting described, um, which was that, because I had never understood the significance of the white stone, but apparently the Romans had uh, a custom that somebody who was um, condemned to die, they had this opportunity to choose. So they had a bag with two stones, a black stone and a white stone. And if they picked the white stone they lived and if they picked the black stone then they they were killed uh, but also if they picked the white stone they were given a new name and a new identity so people wouldn't identify them as a murderer and so then they could start a new life over again and in this case i think the beautiful part is that christ um, offered a white stone to everyone who overcomes so essentially, he's making it available to all of us. It's not restricted to um, like a game of chance. Um, so it also talks about, so the, the lesson also asks us to um, compare Revelation 14, 15 and Mark 26 to 29. So let's read those verses. Then I look and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice uh, to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And then uh, let's compare that to Mark 4, 26 through 29. It says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed 
on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow so that he himself does not know uh, how. how. For the earth yields its crop by itself, <clears throat> first the blade, then the head, after that the full, of, full grain in the head. But the grain ripens immediately, he puts the sickle in and the harvest is come. So then um, I, I noticed the lesson also used the Christ object lessons to, to kind of explain this illustration. So I, I referred back to Christ object lessons and found a couple of extra quotes from there. It says, the sower soweth the word. Here is represented the great principle which should underlie all educational work. The seed is the word of God. But in too many schools of our day, God's word is set aside. Other subje subjects occupy the mind. The study of infidel authors holds a large place in the educational system. Skeptical sentiments are interwoven in the matter placed in school books. Scientific research becomes misleading because its discoveries are misinterpreted and perverted. The word of God is compared with the supposed teachings of science and it is made to appear uncertain and untrustworthy. Thus, seeds of doubts are planted in the minds of the youth and the time of temptation they will spring up. When faith in God's word is lost, the soul has no guide, no safeguard. The youth are drawn into paths which lead away from God and from everlasting life. So I guess the message of this is that it's important to guard what sort of material we expose not just our youth but ourselves to so that if we uh, sow the seeds of skepticism then we will reap, reap um, likewise in, in um, unbelief and ultimately in perdition. And that's not going to help us to get to the victor's crown. <clears throat> so, um, and then it talks about the putting in the sickle because the harvest has come. Um, so it says the husbandman can be Christ uh, and no other. It is he who in the last great day will reap the harvest of the earth. But the sower of the seed represents those who labor in Christ's stead. The seed is said to spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. And this is not true of the Son of God. Christ does not sleep over his charge but watches it day and night. He is not ignorant of how the seed grows. Um, so I, I think the, um, the part here is that it said that Jesus is the husbandman, but we're the sower. So, so it seems like the farmer in this case has divided up into Christ and his representatives. Um, and then this, this part is quoted in the lesson, which says, the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life and the development of a plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace, there can be no life uh, without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, Yet it is God's purpose for us to be fulfilled and to be in continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. So I want to just pause for one second about the perfect part, because some people think perfection means that you never make any mistakes. So I think Christ and the Bible have a different definition of perfection, which is doing the right thing at the right moment. So um, you may not have reached perfection yet, but you can be viewed as perfect if you're doing, if you're moving along the path. Um, so finishing up with this quote. Uh, as, just making a side man. Okay. Important piece too. Yes. So if you do make a mistake, ask for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge will increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility and mature and our maturity will produce in proportion to our privileges. And then I wanted to end with an illustration that Paul actually used in the New Testament about the overcomer's crown, which is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. It says, 
do you not know that those who run in a race um, all run, but one receives the prize? <laughs> run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who comes for the, competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do this to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperish, imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but uh, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest I, having preached to others, myself should be disqualified. So I think the... Um, the victor's crown back in the days of Paul and, and in some regards even today we have the Olympic Games that are harken back to the Greeks. Only one person got the medal, the, the gold medal. Uh, and so, but not so with Christ. Everyone can get a golden crown if they overcome sin and their own sinful tendencies. So with that, we'll move on to every seed that produces a harvest. You do that in just a second, Elisa. I just wanted to say one thing before you before we finish. It's it was amazing how people put their whole heart, lives, diet into winning in these the in ancient, these races. Uh, Olympics. Yeah, they 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 eat, they ate it, they breathed it, they lived it. Nothing else took their attention except preparing for that race. And that's so. how we should really live for Christ. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Elisa, thank you. Uh, every seed produces a harvest. Yeah, so in Revelation 14, we read of two harvests. It's the harvest of the grain, which is God's faithful people, and the harvest of the wicked, which represent, is represented by the cluster of ripe grapes that are thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. So we just discussed the harvest of grain a little bit. Um, so now let's take a look at Revelation 14, 17 to 20 to learn more about the harvest of the grapes. And it reads, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So what does the expression, the great winepress of the wrath of God, mean? Let's take a look at a few more texts uh, to help us understand that. In Revelation 14, 9 and 10, it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So in this text, we read of the wicked who choose to follow or serve the beast in his image instead of Christ. We learn that the end result is that they are made to drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength. In other words, it is no longer mixed with God's mercy. This is the fate of the wicked. The righteous do not have to partake of this cup because Christ drank that bitter cup for them at Gethsemane and at the cross. In Galatians 3.13, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And because Christ's faithful people have submitted their lives to him, his suffering has paid their sin penalty and his righteousness has been given to them as a robe of righteousness to cover their shame. Let's also read in Revelation 15, 1, and that says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And in Revelation 16, 1, we read, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, 
Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. In these texts we read that the angel who came out from the altar in the heavenly temple had power to command the fires of God's final judgment. The harvest is fully ripe. Sin has run its course. It has reached its limit. God can no longer extend his mercy to the wicked because they have fully rejected Christ. The people of the earth are divided into two camps. Those that are fully and unreservedly committed to Christ and nothing can shake their loyalty to him. And those who have compromised their integrity, chosen to rebel against Christ and have aligned with Satan's deception. We read that with the drinking of this cup of God's wrath, the wicked are left to experience the final plagues that fall on the earth. Revelation 20, excuse me, Revelation 14, 20 had also said that the blood comes out of the winepress of God's wrath up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. The author of the lesson explains that 1,600 furlongs is about 184 miles, which is approximately the length of Israel from north to south. The imagery here conveys that the destruction of evil will be complete. There will not be one vestige of sin left in the land. Not one trace of evil will remain, and sin will be finally and completely blotted out forever. Revelation 14 pronounces an urgent prophetic message for us living in the last days of Earth's history. Every seed has gone to harvest. There is no partially ripe, no middle ground. The people of God reveal his character of grace, compassion, mercy, and love, while the children of evil reveal the character of Satan, greed, lust, jealousy, and hate. The whole universe will see in God's people a revelation of his righteousness. And in contrast, the universe will also see the full results of rebellion and sin in the character of the wicked. The purpose of this prophetic warning in Revelation 14 is to produce an abundant, glorious harvest for the Lord. None need be lost, for Christ has already paid the penalty for each of us, and he pours out his love and all the resources of heaven to save us. When by grace we accept his sanctifying power in our lives, we will daily grow in our spiritual walk with him, and he is able to prepare us for this glorious harvest. And in my final thought for the day, I want to read for you from Christ's Objects Lessons from Ellen G. White, <clears throat> a short paragraph, and it says, When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but also to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And finally, I'd like to say... I'd like to share this from our companion book that's written with the quarterly. It's only when you and I live in joy of Christ's presence and the light of his salvation can our lives be filled with the abundance he offers. If we live in the guilt of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow, we will certainly be discouraged. Will you choose today to respond daily to the wooing of God's spirit, live in the joy of his grace, and receive that we have a Savior who has done and is doing and will do everything he can to save us. We are sowing seeds and preparing for the final harvest. Jesus is coming again, and he longs to take us home to live with him forever. Let's all make that choice. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a beautiful lesson we've had today, Father. We thank you, thankful that your spirit has been with us. We're thankful that we were able to look at what's ahead of us, that we can too have your grace, that we can have your peace, 
and that you will walk with us day by day, that we make choices for you, that we sow seeds, that we, we uh, harvest as well. But Lord, you will do the final harvest, and that harvest is when you take us home to be with you. So Father, we look forward to the day and pray that it's sooner than later. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.